So really quickly back to just a small amount of color theory and then I swear we're done with color theory, but this will come back up over and over and over in the work that we do. So I will refer to stuff about this later on as we go through all of this. So anyway, for what that's worth, how many people have ever seen one of these? Yeah, I mean, you see them in color theory all the time and they talk about it. Nobody, uh, uh, so, but anyway, just to describe what this is really quickly, because th this is just a visual aid to figure out what it is we're really doing and what it is we're really trying to do. This is a chromaticity diagram and this is supposed to be a representation of human vision. So, but the truth of it is, this is actually a slide that's on my computer coming through a projector here. So your human vision is actually able to concise considerably more. So you need to just count this as a, a representation. This is not real human vision uh, limits right here, but it is to tell you that there is a color space that you can look at you, that, that your eyes respond to that um, there's, there's issues that are within that system that we need to talk about and see how we can ultimately overcome in our, uh, uh, in our work with color. So this is represents human vision. It is subject again to the display, what I just said to you guys about that. What you'll notice about this is that the purest colors, like all of our color models, are at the very edge of this. As we start to move towards the center, we're getting to much neutral, more neutral color. And at some point right here in the center, at some place, whatever, you have a completely neutral gray. You have no color at all. So again, saturation is at the edges here. So as we move from this neutral center, well, it's not really the center, but that's because the shape of this is not a circle because your eyes and you, your human eyes are not uh, 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 sensitive to different colors in the same amount. Your eyes are hypersensitive to green. Your eyes can see a great deal more in green than they can actually see in this red or in this case red or purple here. Uh, but at any rate, saturation is at the edges of this. This matters to us hugely when we're going from one space to another. Neutral is in the very center. This is a two-dimensional space. Again, brightness is what is missing in here. Um, but this does allow us to compare different color spaces and that becomes important to us. So here are the primary color spaces that you would be normally accustomed to dealing with. The ones that we deal with the most would be sRGB, and you can see sRGB is this little triangle that's right here. Actually, actually oh, let me do this on the screen. It'll be... I need to get out of this in order to have a cursor. But this little triangle in here is sRGB. The bigger one is Adobe RGB. The biggest one is Profoto RGB. And then this squiggly line is the color space of a matte paper on an Epson 4800 printer. That's what we're basically looking at right here. So does that make sense, everybody, what's going on here? So when I talked about being able to compare things, you can readily see that the Adobe RGB color space is uh, uh, completely encapsulates the sRGB. Well, not completely, but almost completely encapsulates the sRGB color space. It's a bigger space, specifically up into the greens. You have considerably more greens that you can deal with. Profoto also is an enormous color space, but does anybody see a problem with Profoto by looking at this? Shoot. Exactly. You can actually have color in a Profoto RGB space that you can't see. And that to me is a huge problem. So there's a lot of proponents that say you should be working in Profoto RGB the whole time. The two downsides that you have to it is, is that the space is so big, eight bits is not adequate to really describe the space. Eight bit is big enough to actually describe prof uh, Adobe RGB, sRGB, and basically the color space that you would have of a given printer. But Profoto is not. So for me, there's two problems with that. Profoto means you, if you're going to work in Profoto, which if you want to in this class, you can do that. Two things to be aware of, though. One is you have to be in 16-bit, which doubles your file size. And then two, you also have to know that mathematically you can shove color out beyond where your eyeballs can actually see. And if that's a risk that you're willing to take, go for it. Uh, anyway, uh, gamuts refer to this. So the space that we're talking about, these borders, or these edges of it, or the actual space, they are actually called color gamuts. So 
This represents the Adobe RGB color gamut. This is the Profoto color gamut. This is the sRGB color gamut. So I'm sure all of you guys have heard out of gamut color. That's one of our biggest problems that we're going to try to deal with right now. So colors that are uh, inside of the outline, uh, colors, I'm sorry, not inside of the outline are called out of gamut for that space. So if you take a look at the Adobe RGB space, it's right here. If I have a color that's up in here, it is not inside of the Adobe RGB space. It's considered out of gamut. And if it's an important thing to us, we have an issue with how do we then deal with the out of gamut color because you don't simply want to throw it away. That's where detail exists. That's where tone exists. That's where color inf information about your image exists. You don't want to just toss it. So neutral gray, again, the neutral gray in this, they are common to all of them. This neutral gray spot in here is common to all of these color spaces. That never ever shifts here. It's just how much larger the space is. And again, Remember, the distance from this neutral point to these edges is all about saturation. So you can have a far more saturated green in Profoto RGB than you can in Adobe RGB than you can in sRGB. Does that make sense, everyone? Um, the more saturated color, the further it is from the center, the more likely it will be out of gamut. Out of gamut, and this is the takeaway from this, the biggest problem that we have in this game of taking color from a computer monitor and putting it into a print form or getting it up on a website or all of that kind of stuff, the biggest issue that we've got is saturation. Saturation is what is, our, is at stake. It's not light or dark. You can go from a completely black screen to a completely white screen, but you can also go from a completely white piece of paper to a completely black piece of paper. So lightness isn't the issue. All of them are capable of doing RGB or CMYK, so color hue is not our problem. What the problem that we always run into is saturation. Your monitors can, can be far more saturated than a print will ever be. So saturation is the thing that kills us on this. That's where the biggest of the mismatches actually comes from. So, again, if we take a... Yes? Is that why what? Like colored film prints are a lot more saturated. When you say color film print, what do you really mean? Like, like the color processor. Like the color oh, but that's not true at all. Yeah. You can, no, 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 no. There's, there's printing systems that will blow that out of the water. Oh. Yeah, and the source doesn't matter. It's, yeah. the, it's, it's, it's the destination part of it that matters. Yeah, so you can actually get, there's printers that, there will, like die sub printers, they're really hard to find. Not die sub, uh, um, um, Die transfer, uh, you can get way more saturated than, than any sort of like typical silver print that you'll ever see. So anyway, but if we take a look at this right here, again, this is the human vision part that we're going around here. The red in here is a typical monitor, a typical RGB monitor. And the blue dotted line around here is process. This would be a process printing, meaning CMYK, not an RGB printer. The RGB printers that are out here, the ones that you guys might use, actually have considerably larger gamut than uh, what they would call like an offset press. Like the press, a CMYK press that's used to actually print, you know, newspapers and magazines and, and any of that, posters and all of that kind of stuff, whatever. Those have a smaller gamut even more so than the uh, uh, RGB inkjet printers that exist here in, in the photo lab and even literally a $120, you know, uh, inkjet printer will have a larger gamut than an offset press. Uh, but an offset press can do, you know, a million copies in 30 seconds. I mean, it's, it, they're for very different markets, but that's what we're looking at right here. And in this diagram, what you can see is C1 right here. This is C1 right here. This is as green as that printer can possibly print. It cannot print any greener than that. That's the limit. That's the edge of the saturation that that printer can actually do. However, C2 is information that you can see on your monitor. These, both of these are within the monitor gamut. So you can see both of these colors and you see them as different colors. This is a more saturated green. C2 is more saturated than C1 is. And it's different. And the thing that you need to really, the main takeaway in this that you need to realize is that it's more saturated, so we can see greater saturation in our monitor than we can print, 
but it's also detail. The fact that these are different establishes detail. If these colors are identical, you have no detail. They're the same. Does that make sense to everyone? What we really worry about here is the saturation, but saturation also represents difference, and difference represents detail. So imagine you've got an image that is all one color. Is there any detail in that image? None. But now let's say you have a green square right in the middle of that big red field. Do you have detail? Yes, you do, because you've got a different color. Let's say that you have uh, there, it's big old red field, but you've also got a, a, a different saturation red field. Well, here, let's just do this really quick. Everybody jump into Photoshop real fast. I'm going to do a new synthetic file, Command N, or up to the file menu and down to New. In the drop down in the dialog box, I typically always do this in inches, not in pixels. So I'm going to click on the drop down to get inches. And I'm going to do a width of 10, a height of 8. I'm just using the tab key to move from one of the little uh, dialog boxes to the next. And I'm going to do it at 300 pixels per inch. And I'm going to say OK. So we've got a color field that's sitting right here. I'm going to click on, I mean, a, just a, a single image is sitting right here. I'm going to click on my foreground color and we just, I want a pure red. So simply click in the color picker that opens up, double click for the R value. So right next to the R radio button, double click in that little space and type in 255 and say, okay, because again, 255 by definition, zero green, zero blue is a pure red. You can see it's all the way pure red, 100% brightness, 100% saturation and a hue of zero degrees. And I'm going to go ahead and say, okay to that. And now red is my foreground color. So if I hold down the option key and hit delete or backspace on Windows, it will actually fill it with red. And you can actually see here, I've got detail here. It works great. I mean, I have no detail here, but I've got a solid red here. I'm going to add another layer to this. To add another layer, go to the bottom of your layers palette. You will see that there's a little square that's got a plus in the middle of it. If you click on that, it will actually add a new layer for you. And then I am going to do, let's just do a, um, a selection in the middle of this. So I'm going to come up and I'm going to grab the square marquee tool. So it's the second icon down on your tool tab. If you click on this and come down, if you hold uh, on the lower right hand corner, You'll get a flyout menu and you can either do a rectangle marquee tool, an elliptical one, a single row or a single column. Just make sure you've clicked on the marquee tool itself. The minute you do that, you should, your eyes immediately should go up to the options palette that's sitting up at the very top. It's this guy right here. These change for every single tool that you select. The options up here will change. So the minute you go to a tool, a different tool, you should be looking up here to make sure that you know what it is you're really doing. So when I look up here, I see uh, option to change my feathering. I want to make sure that my feathering is at zero and I want to make sure that my style is normal and simply click and drag out a square in the middle of this. Now with that square actually selected, I am going to, again, I'm working on my top layer here, that layer number one. I'm going to fill it with that same color red. So again, I'm just going to hold down either option, uh, option and hit either delete or backspace, depending on Mac or not. And it actually, you can see, if you're looking at my layers palette, you can see it filled that with red. Fine. Command D will get rid of the selection. And now you can turn this thing on and off, and you'll see absolutely no change because they're the same color. There is no detail here. It is all the same color. In order to get something that represents detail, you need a difference in either color, saturation, or brightness, or all three, some combination. There needs to be, it needs to be different, and in some cases, pretty significantly different. So instead, I'm going to click on the foreground color picker again. I'm going to open this up, and I'm simply going to uh, uh, select the uh, S button for saturation. It should still be loaded with that same red that we had. And I'm just going to drag my saturation down to about 50%. Uh, so you can actually type in 50% if you want to on that, but or just get close. It doesn't really matter. And I'm going to go ahead and say OK to that. 
Now, I need to reload this selection. Now, this is one of the keyboard shortcuts that we will use in every single class from this point on. So this is one to try to remember. Again, I don't use tons of them, but this one is important. To make a selection of damn near anything in Photoshop, hover your cursor over the icon, over the little picture. So do not hover over the eyeball. Don't hover over the name that says layer one. Hover over the icon. If we had a mask here and I wanted to load the mask as a selection, I would hover over the icon of the mask. But hover over the icon and you'll see, I'm not touching anything. You have the little finger pointing, right? Hold down your option key and look what happens. I'm sorry, not your option key, your command key. So command or control if you're on Windows and you will notice that it adds a little square underneath the finger and the little square is made up of marching ants. And if you then click on that icon, it will load that selection. And to see what happened, I'm gonna turn off my red underground layer. This, um, the checkerboard on here represents transparent pixels. So there's nothing for here to select. So it simply selected this red, the area that was already, that I had already filled earlier. Is this working for everyone? Again, guys, if you sit here and you just listen to this lecture, you're fucking dead in this class. I'm telling you right now, you have got to do this shit. So if you get fall behind, stop me, say, no, sir, I didn't get that step. Do not sit here and watch this stuff. You will hate this class and it's too late to drop it and get your money back now. All right, so I've got this selection going. I'm actually gonna fill it with my foreground color again. There's, I can fill on top of the color I've already got. So option delete fills it, command D, deselects it, and I'm gonna turn on my red back here underneath it. Now you can see a difference in these two. That is detail. This represents detail. Imagine this on a pixel by pixel level. That's all detail. So back to our color lecture, here, the issue that I'm struggling with here in this is that I have got C1 and C2 are different. I can see the difference on my screen, but right now I've got to do something. If I want to print this out, I've got to do something about all of the tone and the color that's sitting in C2 or around that. Does that make sense what's going on here? Okay, so, sorry. Why are you all the way over there? Hang on. Oh, uh, it's all the way over there because it's all the way over there on the slide. And I have no idea why that's... Thanks. But look on the slide, it's like, it's, you know, anyway, thanks. Okay. So C1 is as green as the printer can print. C2 is out of gamut for the print, but in gamut for the monitor so I can see it. The distance between these two represents image detail. Profiles can handle the color mismatch of these gamuts. However, you need to use rendering intents to tell the profile how you want that to happen. So how many people in this room have ever seen or know of rendering intents? So what do you guys know about them? So most people have heard rendering intents. You'll hear people say this all the time. Oh, you need to use perceptual rendering intent when you're dealing with photography. Anybody in this room hear that? Or relative color metric? Or you guys have never seen or heard of a rendering intent? So we're gonna look at it really quickly. I'm gonna go back to Photoshop. Please do the same thing with me. We are gonna go into our very same file that we still got up here. We're just going to print it. So come up to the file menu and come down to print. And in the print, I don't care what profiles you actually have set up here. None of this part matters. This, I mean, it matters if we were really going to print it out. But what I really want to get to is this guy right down here, rendering intent. 
And if you click on this drop down menu, you will see there's four of them. And most of you as photographers have been told you use either relative color metric or perceptual. But nobody's ever bothered to tell you why. They just tell you that it's the worst kind of teaching in the world that there is. Why wouldn't that tell you what they mean so that you can decide which one you want to use or better yet, the best one for you to use instead of just giving you some blanket statement. And I say this to you because I am going to show you the difference in what they all are. And I just suggest that you go, you know, you get together with your friends tonight and say, OK, let's Let's make a wager on the evening. I will bet you I can tell you something that you don't know, and if I'm correct, you buy drinks for the rest of the night. How's that sound? And they're gonna say, sure, okay, I'll take that bet. And you'll say, okay, explain rendering intents to me in Photoshop. Boom, you'll be drinking free for the rest of the night. But at any rate, it's these four. All four of these are built into your color profile. So the ICC profile or the, uh, um, uh, the color profiles that we work with, the DNG profile, all of that kind of stuff, have all four of these built into it. So that's why I can come in here and I can select any one. If I, so I'm, I, I've got a printer profile that's in here. I'm gonna change this to perceptual. It simply changes the way the profile uh, 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 deals with out of gamut color. So that's where these things are and we need to talk about what they do really quickly and then we are done with color correction. So, I mean, uh, color theory. So let me go back to this really guy really quick. So again, I don't have a cursor when I'm doing this. So I just want to explain what's going on here. The whole outer circle represents an RGB gamut. The smaller circle on the inside represents a CMYK gamut. And again, we're just making this as circles now. You can imagine this is a color wheel. Again, the CMYK printer is, it, 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 when you print something out, its max saturation is nowhere near as saturated as a monitor can be. So all this color, one, two, and three, these three colors in here are considered in gamut colors. Four, five, and six are out of gamut. You can see four, five, and six on your monitor, but your printer cannot print them. So how do we deal with those? And that is controlled by your rendering intent. Your profile will do the color matching, but the profile has no way of dealing with the saturation issue, the saturation mismatch. So does that make sense what this illustration is? So again, one, two, and three are in gamut. To both of them, this is common. This is inside of the, uh, of the small CMYK space, but it's also inside the RGB space. So if one, two, and three was all I ever had, I, knew I wouldn't need to worry about this because everything is in, in gamut. It's the same in both spaces. I wouldn't worry about it. But four, five, and six, I've got a problem with that. And the thing that you need to know about four, five, and six is that they are different from each other. Six is more saturated than five, is more saturated than four. They are different. That represents not only saturation, that represents detail. Right? OK. So the first rendering intent, saturation. What happens in the first one for saturation is, so again, 1, 2, and 3 are in gamut for both of them. 4, 5, and 6 are out of gamut. So what happens if you use the saturation intent is that it will move four, five, and six to the very edge of the saturation, the most saturation that the printer can print. There's a downside to this. You lose all the detail. We've got to move these into this space. So there's no question about whether the move was right or wrong. But in using saturation, what happens is that these colors all become identical. So you lose all of that detail because they become the very same color. But the distance that's moved in is also applied to one, two, and three, the colors that are inside the color space. They are also moved in because what Photoshop is trying to do, or any program that's doing this, it's trying to keep the relationship between one, two, and three, four, five, and six roughly the same. So everything gets shifted in, and all of the colors that were out of gamut become a single color. And the reason they do this is that they're trying to keep maximum saturation in this whole setup, but differences to give you detail. This is a horrible perception, this is a horrible uh, rendering intent to use for photography because it changes every single color in your image. 
It plays with saturation and it's not all the same. These, these all become the same thing, so you lose detail. The reason they have these is to keep maximum saturation. This works well for people who do graphic design. So you know those little color weather maps that are on like the back of USA Today, or you'll look through anything, you know, they're color weather maps showing you which rain, you know, what part of the, of the United States is gonna be drought and what part of the United States has got a lot of rain or what's gonna be really hot and what's gonna be really cold. And they just put these arbitrary colors on them. It's important for you to see the distinction between those colors, but the color doesn't make any difference at all. They can say, oh, that region is really hot and it can be like red or it can be yellow or it can be orange or, you know, it doesn't really, you don't care. You don't know what color it's supposed to be, but in a photograph you do. If all of a sudden you take something in your photograph that's supposed to be red and you make it orange, like my skin, and you make it orange, then I look like Donald Trump and I just want to kill myself. So, but anyway, this works really well for graphic uh, arts people. The second one is perceptual. This is the one that you've been taught probably to use most of all in photography, because what this does is this actually preserves all the detail. So what happens here is six, which is the most saturated out of gamut color, gets moved right to the edge of what the printer can actually print. And then everybody else is moved equal distance and it keeps the relationship between all of these intact. It desaturates the image, which is uh, by definition what we have to do. But for, once it moves in here, you can see six is right on the edge. Five is different. Five is even further in. Four is even further in. So that four, five, six relationship is maintained which maintains the detail, but then in order to keep the relationship with colors, one, two, and three also have to be moved in, less saturated. Again, the direction when we talk about moving these to the left, we're heading, the, although all of them are heading towards the center, they're all becoming less saturated. But this keeps all of our color detail intact. And they've done experiments, and they know this to be true, that your eyes are more sensitive to the relationship of colors than they are to whether the color is actually the true color or not. So in this case, perceptual, you change every single color of your photograph, but the relationship of all of those colors remains the same. They all just get less saturated, but you keep all the detail. And that's critical for photography. That's why most people say your go-to should be uh, uh, perceptual. However, I disagree with that, and I'll show you why in just a second. Color metric. So what happens in color metric is all of the colors are moved, the ones that are out of gamut, they're moved to this space to keep the, uh, again, to be, to, to be, to be, they have to be printed. But we, again, we lose all the detail in four, five, and six. However, one, two, and three are not changed at all. One, two, and three um, uh, remain their normal color. So now I've got a mismatch of color. I've ruined that relationship. But what is happening here in this is, is that if I did not have any color that was out of gamut, I would want to use one of the color metric spaces to, or uh, uh, rendering intents to maintain the integrity of the color that's here, the color that's in gamut. So if I have nothing that's out of gamut, I don't care. I wanna keep my color as true and pure as it can be. I wouldn't wanna use anything in the perceptual world because I run the risk of if there's anything even slightly out of gamut, I change all of the colors in my image. If I have nothing that is out of gamut, I don't wanna change any of those colors. Make sense? And so there are two kinds of color metric. There is relative, and what happens in relative color metric is, is that it looks at the white point of your monitor, the brightest spot of your monitor, which should be white, and it maps that to the brightest spot of your piece of paper. What happens in absolute is there is not that mismatch. What happens is, is that it will, it, it will take the white point of what you see on your monitor it will try to recreate that white point on your print, and then it will apply that change a second time. 
Now this gets to be a little bit confusing, so I'm gonna give you an analogy of what basically would happen. Let's say you scan an old Western poster that's very yellow, and you decide you're gonna print it out on your uh, inkjet printer, and you use a relative color metric. What'll happen is, it will look at the white point of your screen and it will match it to the white point of your paper and it will print out that poster and you will see, let's say you've got a border of paper around it, you will see a white border around it with the poster printed and the print hopefully will look pretty much like the poster. What happens in absolute is it's going to look at the white point of the image, which is yellow. It's gonna then try to recreate the entire white, your, your entire piece of paper. It's going to try to make it that yellow. And then it's going to put the yellow poster on top of the yellow piece of paper. So you get a double hit of yellow. I know. There's reasons to actually have this. People in, um, uh, who are doing certain kind of proofings for prints can actually use this. Certain things, there's certain instances to use this. It's pretty rare. I don't really know of anybody who uses this consistently, but just so that you know, that's basically what's going on here. Shoot. Um, so is there, a way, is there a way to know when you're outside? Yes, there is. And that's right where we're heading. Okay. So the issue comes down to this for photography. Now there's people in here who have multiple disciplines. If you're a graphic designer, this does not necessarily apply to something that you're doing that, that is non-photographic, something that would just be you know, big red arrow and, you know, the I love New York and how red can the New York be and or the heart, you know, that's a completely different ballgame. That is not photographic. But for our purposes, what matters here is uh, for photography, it's either perceptual or relative color metric. So how do you know? Well, again, we go back and what we've talked about here earlier. If you've got a lot of out of gamut color, you are better off using perceptual. It moves everybody in. It keeps the relationships between all the colors, it maximizes the detail. However, if you've got something that's got very little that is out of gamut, you are better off using relative, um, you're better off using relative color metric because it keeps the color that's in gamut exactly the color it is. This really matters. If you're shooting a, a can of Coca-Cola, I, can, can, I can trust you that the people at Coke, Coke, the red of Coca-Cola can is trademarked. And you cannot go to them with your picture of Coca-Cola and say, well, it's close, right? So let's see how you figure this part out. Everybody into Photoshop again really quickly. If you can find the red car that we used in class number one, so go back to our class number one, open up the red car. You can close up the file that we just had, the synthetic one that had the different colors on it. You don't need to save it. I'm going to hide others, double click on hand to make this big. You can actually do what they call soft proofing. And this is where we figure out how much trouble we are in the, with the car or not. So before we go there, I need everybody to check their preferences quickly first. And uh, if you're in uh, Macintosh world up to the Photoshop uh, menu down to preferences, and we're going to come down to transparency and gamut. If you're on a Windows machine, you get to the same place by going into the edit menu down to your preference settings and go into this very same place. I need to make sure that you have changed your gamut warning to this bright green color. It, by default, it comes with Photoshop. It comes in a middle gray. To change this to this really neon green, you simply click on the color. It'll open up the color picker. And again, click on your R value, type in zero, hit the tab key, go to your green value, type in 255, hit the tab key and type in zero blue. That is a pure green by definition, no red, no blue, all the maximum amount of green, 255. Say okay and close up your preferences. And that way we can really see where the out of gamut part shows up. So in order to view this, come up to the view menu and come down, the very first thing that we need to do is do our proofing setup. Now in proofing setup, by default, it's actually set up to emulate a CMYK printer, an offset press, because to be perfectly honest with you, the majority of images that are reproduced in the world in print are done on a CMYK printer. However, we can actually do other things. So for instance, if you have a color profile, now you guys may have color profiles. Does anybody in this room have a custom color or just a regular color profile 
of, of, in, of the paper that you use. So we, you can actually check the color gamut of that as well. So I'll show you both. But I want to start with this CMYK. This was also, this is a swap coded CMYK. This is what we set up in our color edit settings. But, so I'm going to leave this at this working CMYK and then come back up to the view menu and come down to gamut warning. And you will see all the spots on the car that are out of gamut. This is showing you what you can see on your screen, but your printer cannot print. So everything that is underneath this green is going to become one color if we use relative color metric. All of the other colors will not change. However, if we use perceptual, all of the color that is under the green will be moved into the space, but it will keep its differences. So all the detail that is under here will be maintained. If I use relative color metric, all the color that is underneath this green gets made one single color and you can spot it a mile away. It looks like something weird has happened to your image. Does that sort of make sense, everyone? So you can actually change the color intents of this to in your viewing as well. So come back up to your proofing setup, come over to custom, and in the custom drop down menu, you can see your rendering intents sit right here. If you change this rendering intent to perceptual and then say okay, you will see that there is really no change in this because again, this is your warning. This is not what your car is going to look like. This is your warning. But I can actually see what is going to what this is going to be like if I print this out on a specific piece of paper. To get to that, go back up to the view menu, again down to your proof setting, a down, again down to custom. And when this thing opens up, you will have a drop down menu of devices to simulate. And if you click on that drop down menu, it has every profile that's loaded onto your computer. So let's say, for instance, I'm a person who, I'm going to scroll down here. I'm going to use my Epson 2800 and I'm going to print on an Entrada. Uh, a Moab Entrada uh, um, matte paper on this guy. So I'm going to go ahead and pick that guy and look what happened to what was out of gamut. That inkjet printer printing on this Entrada, that specific inkjet printer onto this Entrada, can handle so much of what was out of gamut. The little bit here, down in here, these areas that are flagged in green, I'm not that concerned about. There's not that much detail there anyway. So for me, printing on this printer, I'm much better off actually using a relative color metric on this than I'm actually to use perceptual on this because there's so little that's out of gamut. If I use perceptual, it will change every single color in my image. And if the car maker cares about the color of the car, then I'm in trouble. Is this making sense to everyone? So this is the tool that you use to know which coloring intent, rendering intent you use. You are now an informed pro. Are we good on this? Questions about this? Okay. You can say, uh, I'm going to cancel this out because I don't want to change my proofing space. But anyway, um, and I'm going to turn my gamut warning off. Um, so that I don't have that red, and we are going to move on unless there are any other questions about this. Okay, um, I need to make sure everyone's got their Wacom tablet back on. If you have one, if you don't have one, don't worry, you can do this with a mouse as well, but I want to get people starting to work with a tablet so we can just sort of see how some things are going to go here. You can close this image up. You don't need to save it. I need a new synthetic image, Command N, to bring up a new dialog box. Again, I'm going to do my 10 by 8 by 300. and say okay to that. While we're on this, I just want to make sure that this is something that we get to before we really need it, so it doesn't really go into the whole rest of the lecture, but it's important for this part right now. So, I need everybody to hit the B key. That will give you the brush, and we need to talk about brushes uh, uh, in a big way here. So, 
Again, I hit the B key and you've got a little circle. You should have a little circle that's got a little uh, uh, crosshair in the middle of it. We set that up by default. If you don't, you need to go back and look at the preference uh, video that we did in the very first uh, day or tap me uh, during a break. But again, your eyes should go up here to the very top and look at the preferences that we've got set up because these things have a huge impact on how our, uh, 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 the stylus will work on your Wacom tablet. So up here at the very top, there is a drop down menu up here at the very top. It's right next to a brush size. You'll see in my case, it says 150. That's just telling me my brush is 150 pixels wide. If you use the bracket keys just to the left of the P key, the one that's immediate, I'm sorry, to the right of the P key, the one that's immediately to the right of the P key will make your brush smaller. So I'll show you what this looks like, makes it smaller. The one that's to the right of that makes it larger. So this is how I control brush size. Now, a lot of people in this room might use the heads up display to do this. If you do that, that's fine. I don't use that heads up display. But if you are that advanced and you know how to do that, you want to do that, great. If you want to know how to do it and you, and I'm not telling you right now, just tap me again, send me an email, whatever. I'll take time out, carve time out to either meet with you and show you how it works or I'll do it for the whole class. But anyway, uh, I'm just so used to using the bracket keys. It's just faster for me. If you click on the drop down menu that is the little arrow that's right next to that, you actually have um, uh, controls at the very top. You'll see I've got a size control and a hardness control. Um, you also, if you've got underneath this, you should have a series of brushes. And the first one should be general brushes. You should have your, your, your um, uh, uh, image should actually, or the dialog box should uh, basically look like this. You can collapse this. These are simply groups of brushes. There's general brushes, dry, medium, whatever. There's a whole set of these. There's also a place for custom brushes. There's legacy brushes in here. If you don't have legacy brushes and you want to add them, meaning that this is an older series of general brushes that Photoshop used to do. Look at the little gear that's at the very top. Click on that little gear and come down and say that you want to, uh, uh, legacy brushes will be down at the very bottom. If you click on that, it will add the legacy brushes to your Photoshop, uh, uh, to this whole brush palette, and it'll be down here, here. So these are legacy brushes that exist right here. Again, it's a whole set of them. But for our purposes, I want you to actually click on the general brushes. It should be at the very top, and click on the little drop-down uh, uh, icon to actually open this up. If you click on the one that's at the very top, you'll see it says soft round. And you'll also notice that there is a little preview of it up here. These are also aliases to get to these guys really quickly. I do not use these guys up here because these things up here change. This is a dynamic scale up here. So depending on other brushes that you've actually selected, something else could actually be up here. But I'm gonna select this soft round brush and you'll notice that the hardness just got made zero and my size does not change. Now, if you want to use this brush, if you go ahead and type, if you want your brush to be work exactly like mine, just drag it up so that you get 300 pixels. To get rid of this flyout menu, what a lot of people will do is they'll actually come over onto their image and they'll click on their image to get rid of it. And you see if you do that, it actually makes a mark on your image. We don't want that to happen. So hit Command Z to undo that. I also don't want to be painting in this light color of, of sort of salmon. So if you simply hit the D key, it will default your foreground colors to black and white. If black is your background color, you only can paint with a foreground color. You need to hit the X key to make black your foreground color. So everybody got black as their foreground color? Okay. Click on that drop down menu again to get rid of this flyout menu without marking your image. You come up to the word that says Adobe right next to Photoshop at the very top and simply click on Adobe. It will get rid of that flyout menu but not make any mark on your image. And then you can come down on your image and you can click once to make a mark. And that's what a soft brush looks like. It's got a very soft edge. I'm going to hit Command Z to undo that. I'm going to go to my bracket keys just to the right of the P key. I'm going to go to the one that's all the furthest to the right, and I'm going to tap it till I get a much larger image. So now I've got a pixel size brush of 1100 pixels, and I'm going to click once more. And it's easier to see what a soft brush actually looks like. I'm going to go back up to that drop down menu, and I'm going to select the next one down in the general brushes, the hard round. 
And you'll notice that the only thing that changes is the hardness goes to 100%. Again, I'm going to click on the name Adobe and come down on my image and click one more time. Now, these two brushes are exactly the same size, but they are very different in what they laid down on your image. So one starts, they're both jet black in the very center, but the soft brush starts to fade out. Um, it fades all the way to the same size as this big one, but again, it gets so light that you can't really see that there's any pigment there. But that's the difference in those two. Go back up to that same guy again. If you take a look at the next four that are down, and that's typically the group that we only work with in here. The next four down, what this next one will say is a soft round. Uh, it's, so it's going back to the soft round at the very top, but that pressure controls its size. So I want to get rid of everything that's on my image. I'm going to go ahead and select the soft round pressure size. Again, I'm going to click on the name. Uh, I'm going to, sorry. I'm going to click on Adobe to get the flyout menu to go away. I don't want these two marks already on my canvas. So again, white is my background color. So command or control plus delete or backspace will fill with your background color. So we're back to white. And now take your tablet and actually your uh, Wacom tablet and start, I'm gonna start in the upper right hand corner and I'm gonna start with a very light touch. And then as I come down, I'm going to press harder and harder and harder. And you can see that it makes my brush uh, 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 um, it controls the size. Pressure controls the size here, so it makes it bigger. I'm going to hit Command Z to undo that, and I'm going to go back over to my drop down menu and go to the next one down. The hard brown, uh, I mean, sorry, the hard round where pressure is controlling the size. Click on Adobe and then do the same trick again. I'm going to make, well, I'll leave it big like this. Start with a very light touch and then come down and make it a bigger touch. Controls the size. Command Z to undo that. I'm going to go back up to the next one, soft round brush, that opacity is now being controlled by the brush pressure. What is opacity? Yes. Have you restarted your computer? Restart your computer. Or just get through this because we're going to take a break in uh, just a few minutes and then restart your computer during the break. Um, 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 so. The difference in, if we take a look at the top up here, we have got brush sizes and hardness we've already talked about. We've got blending modes here. If you click on the mode, you'll have a drop down. We have all the blending modes. We're going to talk about blending modes later today. Uh, I'm going to leave mine at normal right now. That's where we do the majority of our work. I've got an opacity of 100% and a flow of 100%. And then I've got a little airbrush icon right here. I've got a little target icon right here. And then I've got smoothing that's actually sitting over here. So, what the hell are these things? Great. So, this is what the hell these things are. In dealing with opacity, opacity is exactly what it sounds like. It's, I mean, we've done, you guys have used layers enough, whatever, to know that you can drop the opacity and stuff starts to show through. So I need to explain what all of these are because they do, a lot of people are confused about the difference in the two and then they ultimately pick the wrong tool to actually do it. So I want you to use the right tool to actually do it. So that's what this whole thing is left about. I'm gonna come back up in my uh, uh, general brushes. I'm gonna click on that drop down, and I'm gonna go up to the top two. Now you've got a soft round and a hard round brush. My suggestion is, is that you only use these two. You do not go in and actually use any of the rest where you're saying to the tablet, okay, pressure is going to control opacity, pressure is going to control flow, pressure is going to control size, or any combination of those. In my opinion, it's easier to do the settings in the uh, 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 options uh, uh, part of the brush uh, when we select the brush, the options that come up to the top. It's easier for me to control it there because I can see it the whole time. It's visible to me. What am I doing? What kind of brush do I have? It's just simpler. When you select it in the type of brush that you're working with and then you collapse that little dialog box, you don't get to see what brush you're using. Well, is this brush still set up to, to, to do opacity by pressure or whatever it is? So I don't use those um, at all. It's the top two or the only two that I use. And more often than not, I will just go in and I'll actually just change the hardness right off the bat. So more often than not, even though I've got a soft round brush, if I click the hardness and drag it all the way over, you'll notice 
that instead of a blue circle, or, I mean a blue outline around this brush now, it's got an orange one. That's to warn you that you've actually changed something. So even though this says soft round brush, because I made the hardness 100%, this is a hard brush. Make sense? All right. Again, click on the name Adobe to get rid of this. Oh, actually, I'm going to go back. I've got a completely hard brush. I'm going to brush a little bit smaller. Black is my foreground color. And I'm simply going to click and drag across. That's what a hard brush looks like at 100% opacity. I'm going to drop my opacity. Please do this with me down to 50%. I just use a scrubby slider to do it. And I'm going to come right underneath this one. And I'm simply going to drag and go across. And do not lift your, if you're doing this on a tablet, do not lift your stylus. If you're doing it on a trackpad, do not lift your finger off the trackpad. Come back. Go back and forth between the two. And what you'll notice that is happening is, is that this is not building opacity. It laid down 50% opacity. This is a middle gray. It's half of the black. So it's 50% of the opacity of my foreground color it gives me a middle gray. Now, most people would think, OK, well, if you do that a second time, it will then make black because 50% plus 50%. But the truth of it is what Photoshop does is that Photoshop is constantly comparing what you're painting on with the foreground color and doing the percentage between the two. So if I click on this now and drag across again, what I get is 75% result because this is a, it was a 50% gray sitting down there. My foreground color is 100%. The 50% between the two is now 75%. If I let go again and hit it a third time, you can see I'm eventually getting, this is a darker gray, but this is not black. I'm eventually getting there. And then finally, as I continue to go over, you can look at the readouts up in your info palette and you can see I'm still getting 15, 15, 15 here after I've passed over this four or five times. It's still not jet black. That's how opacity works. I'm going to drag opacity back up to 100%. And I'm now going to take my flow and I'm going to bring the flow. You got to go way down for your flow. So I'm going to say take your flow down to like 10%. The majority of the time, just so that you know, when you're or close to 10%, 8% will be fine. The majority of the time that you're working in flow, in, when we retouch, we're usually, a lot of times, we're in the 1%, 2% range. What we're trying to do is uh, uh, leverage the same sort of behavior that we're kind of getting with opacity, but never having to remove our stylist off of the tablet. So now, if I've got a flow of 8% or 10%, whatever, now just click and start to drag and go back and forth, and you will see that opacity builds over time. I never have to actually take that little cursor off, and it ultimately continues to build and build and build and build and build, and eventually I get to black. If you come right underneath that one last time and simply put your uh, stylus down and hold it, you will see that it, because of the flow, it's restricting how much ink is coming down. You can think of flow like uh, ink shooting out of the, uh, 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 the tip of your stylus. But unless you move it, if I start to do circles with it, I will eventually get it to build tone. But I have to move it in order for it to continue to lay down ink. If you want it to simply spray ink without moving, you click on that little thing. It's supposed to look like an airbrush icon right next to flow. If you click on that and enable it and then simply hold your stylus down, it will build over time and you will get to black right away. So these are the tools that everybody uses. Oh, and the last one, the opacity, that thing that looks like a little target with the arrow next to it. If you click on that, that gives you pressure is now controlling opacity. So if I come over to my image now, you'll see that if I'm tapping really lightly, I, I get very little opacity. And as I tap harder or I come over here and tap really hard, I will actually get much quicker. Uh, I'll build opacity over time. Again, I don't think this is the place to actually use this. I think starting off working with a graphics tablet, you're much better physically dropping the opacity, then assigning pressure to that. And I also think that flow is something, most people start out working with opacity and then go to flow. I'm going to also suggest you keep the airbrush off until you get really familiar with all of this. Smoothing, what smoothing basically means, I'm going to go ahead and fill this one more time with white. What smoothing basically means is that if I've got a hard brush, which I do right now, 
if you are doing lines like this, actually, hang on one second. Let me go back all the way back up to my flow again. If you're doing little squirrely cues like this kind of stuff, whatever, smoothing will actually help your strokes seem more rounded. Um, it's a pretty esoteric thing. Again, my suggestion is, is that you keep uh, uh, it at its default 10% and that we actually move on. There are questions about brushes. Okay, you can close that up. I have got 301. We're going to call this 3 o'clock even, and I need you guys back here another 10 minute hard break back at 310, and we'll jump into really working on something. <laughs>